You do it in darkness, on an empty stomach, in silence, and alone. Most people who take mushrooms and claim knowledge of what mushrooms are about are, are talking about the two to three gram level. The game doesn't begin to reach five grams. Hello everyone, my name is James Gesso from Adventures Through the Mind, and I'm here to talk to you today about dosing psilocybin mushrooms and the five dried grams in silent darkness that has been proposed by Terence McKenna. Before we get into that, I would like to make it very clear that this video is for harm reduction purposes and is not intended to encourage drug use in any way. It is intended to recognize that some people are going to do it despite the fact that it's illegal and despite the fact that there are inherent risks and the best way that we can help prevent people from getting harmed as well as to basically profit off the benefit. And I mean, I don't mean economically profit. I mean, like emotionally, spiritually profit off the potential benefits that, you know, are only going to be achieved if we mitigate harm. So this video is for harm reduction purposes. So if you've been following me for a little while, you know that I'm a fairly big proponent of psilocybin. In fact, I'm wearing a shirt right now that I got from the Your Mate Tom podcast that has some psilocybin mushrooms to celebrate this video. And um, I talk about a very specific way of using them, which is to enter into a state wherein we are confronted or encounter, we're forced <laughs> to encounter whatever repressed emotional honesty we're carrying in a way that generates a like a larger, bigger picture of the interconnected nuances across time and across our psyche that contributes to our perceptions, to our sense of self, and to the struggles that we're going through. I have often described the dose range for this particular use of psilocybin to being somewhere between enough that you don't have to try and it's just coming out of you, but not so much that you become overwhelmed and the experiences definitely, as Colin E. says, beyond the human. There's no human reflection that you can pair it to to compare because you're not going to be in the human. For myself over time, the dose range that I found that would most work for me would be somewhere between the two to five gram range, dried grams. The thing is, is that I never grew my own and Besides the few lucky opportunities I had to connect with somebody who was growing um, the strains themselves, I pretty much just had to rely on whatever I was given in the bag was um, was what I was told that they were. So I always just assumed what I was getting was whatever the standard psilocybe cubenzies going around would be, which as far as I understand from my experience has for myself been mostly golden teachers. With that, I found that depending on how often I was using the mushrooms, like when I was doing my once a month, every month experience, about four grams is what did it for me. It got me to that place between, I don't have to try, it's all coming out of me, I can just surrender, and there's so much happening here. I've entered the transcendental realms. Most of this feels transpersonal. It's too much for me to handle. I'm confused. It's, you know, it's, it's too mythic to grasp into and weave into the context of my personal history. About four grams did that for me. Depending on how often I am, uh, I am tripping would determine how much, um, what particular dose you know, would bring me to that place. I've also had experiences on strains such as penis envy, where I took two and a half and I felt like I was on a, a, a standard five gram trip, standard five gram trip or five gram trips with standard mushrooms. Which leads into the next part of this video. And as you can tell, this is very different than the uh, the imagery, the framing of the other videos. I'm, I'm shooting this after the fact and late at night with this this light here. But it gets into the next part of the video, which is what kind of makes the difference for people as to 
who is going to be you know next leveled on a gram and a half and who can sit and have five grams and feel at ease um, with their psychedelic encounter and it ties into a recent book that I have been reading called hold on to your kids and in my sort of growing developmental journey of finding models for the psilocybin or the psychedelic experience which are directly applicable to the the journey of becoming ourselves and the journey of becoming more embodied in the we'll just say the baseline operational existence of the human being in the modern world contextual to our personal history um, but as well as to our personal potential without necessarily trivializing overtly rationalizing the psychedelic experience um, so as to lose its sort of mystical or, or mythic sensations but to still have some level of magic contained to it without the magic sort of running off <laughs> running off with itself and becoming so overt that it completely detaches you from your own the, the potentials of what the psilocybin experience can offer ourselves and to each other um, by you know just turning it into one big play of metaphysical abstraction and conjecture that has no actual place in the everyday human life now there's a place for that stuff in poetry and philosophy and and um, and in metaphysics although that's not really my personal goal set my personal goal set is about tying it into personal history and I do so by holding my psilocybin and psychedelic experiences up within the filters of the various ideas and psychological concepts that I explore in my wider variety of writing such as the concepts of orientation voids and compass points which are presented by Gabor Mate and Gordon Neufeld in their book Hold On To Your Kids. So now jumping back to the original uh, recording of this video uh, with less of an intense spotlight. Also, one of the other things that I do is I read fairly broadly across um, different psychological texts and spiritual texts, and I'm always paying attention for different ways of understanding and uh, different ways of comprehending the psilocybin experience and different metaphors or references that I can use to help make the understanding more accessible, help it you know, feel more clear, help it, like I said in the beginning, harm reduction, but also, you know, benefit optimization. Recently, I've been reading a book called Hold On To Your Kids. The basic premise of this book looks at attachment theory and how behavioral problems in children are usually emergent from a problem in the context of relationship between the parents and the children, mainly that the children are no longer healthily attached to their parents and oriented towards their parents as the beings of guidance and structure and support in this world but instead become peer-oriented, which can be problematic because our peers when we're kids are stupid. I mean, I mean, kids are smart, but I mean, they're stupid. They're not mature. They don't understand. They're ignorant and they don't really have that sense of care. So a group of kids might amalgamate to some sense of guidance, but they'll never equal out to uh, their, their emergent intelligence will never equal out to that of a loving, kind parent. There's a lot of considerations there around how, you know, some parents you really just don't want to attach or align with them because they're not safe. And the book really is directed towards parents who want to be safe and give a context for a positive relationship. Anyways, that all being said, it seems like, okay, well, what the hell does that have to do with psilocybin mushrooms and how much to take and how much is too much? What it has to do with is this natural reflex that we have as human beings that Gordon New Newfelt calls the orienting reflex. When we're born as children, we are not completely developed. I mean, some people would even suggest we're not completely developed until we are about the age of 25. And the human nest, which uh, was talked about by Darsha Narvaez in one of the previous episodes of the podcast that I'll link below, it provides the the nurturing context for the full and complete development of the human mind, the human nervous system, the sense of self, and obviously is an extension of that, the integrity of the community. But our nest is set up to facilitate then the best kind of development for that 
baby. And it's especially intense in the early years, but it actually lasts till we are adults, which now the neuroscientists tell us take till about 30 years old, right? So the nest is really a long, long kind of process of support for the good development of the person. So wired into our biology is this need to orient towards something stable that gives us a sense of place so that we are not given a sense of being lost or abandoned or, uh, or whatever. We have a natural reflex to orient towards some sort of authority. Excellent parenting is parenting that encourages an attachment between the child and the um, parent where the parent is the care provider, not the other way around, which is called enmeshment, where the child becomes the pro emotional provider to the parent, but the parent is the care provider. And the role of the parent is to educate and um, guide the child into maturing into an autonomous, self-regulating um, being that is both able to participate in the social ethics, morals, and responsibilities of the larger society, um, as well as being able to be, when needed, a self, like I said, self-responsible, but a divergent, creative, independent being. The thing that we orient to is called a compass point, and so the parents become the compass point. Now, the problems that are suggested in this book, hold on to your kids, say that when peers come to the compass point, then kids can basically get into some problematic behavior. This is too much to unpack here, and I'm not finished reading the book, so I can't really say anyways. But our compass point is our parents when we're young. And if we're raised in a healthy way, then as we get older, um, we will be able to set our compass point somewhere internally. And we won't need to utilize um, you know, social validation or material acquisition or um, um, social, like climbing the social ladder of power or the power complex in order to feel stable in our sense of self. We will be able to main that simply by nature of knowing who we are and knowing where we belong because that was embedded in our nervous system and psyche through a family a parental ecology where the parents were good guiding forces that we remained healthily attached to and developed into us a sense of being connected with ourselves and with the inner authority of our own empowerment. When we do not have that sense of stability, when we do not have a compass point, for example, as children, our parents are, you know, we just can't trust them. They've harmed us in some way. Then we enter into an orienting void. The orienting void is well, it's very disturbing. And so biologically, and also it means death biologically if we don't have a compass point. So we turn towards whatever compass point we can get. Now, again, Neufeld suggests that our first compass point um, from the parent tends to be peers and that can be problematic. So again, what does this have to do with psilocybin mushrooms? Well, I think something that's interesting is the parental context in which we were raised and how our parents raised us to view ourselves and understand and relate to ourselves as a proxy to how they related to us and how we related to them becomes the template by which we relate to our perception uh, and experience and interpretations of our sense of self and reality later. This perception and sense of self is basically contained in the stability of our waking state. And when we disturb that waking state, we disturb our um, sense of orientation to that inner compass point that is our, you know, we'll just say confident sense of self. The loss of compass point or this orienting voids might emerge from, you know, incredible circumstances that happen throughout the course of our lives, maybe a, a, a great loss or a death or an accident or, or whatever, but we, we lose our sense of, of orientation and it becomes very, very disturbing. Now, another way that we lose orientation in our sense of self and our sense of reality is when we take psychedelics. And I was asked recently <clears throat> um, through my, one of my patrons on Patreon about um, you know how I feel about five drive grams in silent darkness and whether or not I think it's safe. I was also recently asked um, by somebody in my community who is interested in trying mushrooms uh, for the first time and they wanted to know how much I thought would be a safe amount for them to start with. And Having read this book, and like I said before, always, um, 
you know, looking for different ways to language these ideas and, and better understand it. I thought about how when we take psilocybin mushrooms, we enter this orienting void and the amount that we could take in order to maintain a sense of um, capacity to not freak out would be determined by our capacity to maintain a compass point to our sense of self or to something else like our breath to maintain our capacity to navigate an orienting void without freaking out. So if we have a fairly low capacity to navigate an orienting void without entering into anxiety, well then less is definitely more when dosing psilocybin. But if we have a higher capacity to maintaining a sense of stability, even in the midst of the orienting void, which is the slipping, loss, dissolving, uh, you know, interlocking locking, <laughs> inter -de locking sense of self that tends to happen when tripping psilocybin mushrooms, if, if we have a capacity to be with that and not feel um, disoriented, we can connect with something that is grounded like our breath or like just a maybe even a trust in a higher force or a trust in the mushroom intelligence or whatever it might be, then we can likely handle more mushrooms. We could likely handle a higher dose and not freak out. And I think this is something that we can work up to. It's a skill set that um, like lifting weights, we can start small and we can um, then later sort of build up our strength to trip higher doses and not become, uh, not freak out due to the orienting void, the chaos that it brings. So how does this all relate again to five dry grams and silent darkness? Is it safe? Is it not safe? Well, I actually think that five dry grams and silent darkness is both irresponsible and dangerous and beautifully transformative and potentially quite positive. And what makes a difference is our capacity to handle the chaos, the disorientation, the orienting void that will come up in the experience. If we're fairly experienced trippers or we were raised in a healthy family environment wherein we have a strong sense of attachment and a strong sense of self-regulating, self-confident self, then we're more likely to be able to handle the intensity of five dry grams and silent darkness. If we can't do that, then it's going to be too much, too soon, too fast, as Devin Christie in one of the earlier episodes of the podcast mentioned and is linked below. And this too much, too soon, too fast can create us a lot of anxiety and maybe even contribute to the development of a bad trip and maybe even contribute to um, what James Kent in a, also an earlier episode of the podcast linked below called a psychotic delusional state. So all of this is basically to, I guess, try to summarize here is that the capacity to which we can feel grounded in the midst of an orienting void, which is an extension of how we have developed our sense of self and sense of reality, will determine our capacity to experience higher and higher doses of psilocybin and it not be um, and it not contribute to anxiety and ultimately damage the person. If you're watching this and you don't have a lot of experience with psychedelics or you find yourself um, easily anxious or easily disturbed or easily sort of cast adrift in an orienting void when things don't go um, exactly how you planned it, you might want to start with a lower dose and um, probably around other people that you could trust that could be a secure compass point for your experience, such as a guide or a psychedelic therapist who works like a compass point to allow us to surrender into a chaos that would otherwise be too great for us to trust in ourselves to go it alone. If you've got lots of experience tripping psychedelics and you feel fairly confident uh, that you can handle it, well then five dry grams in silent darkness might be one of the most it might be a marking point, a checkpoint, a whole a chapter, you know, <laughs> a, ch a positive chapter in your life. It might be one of the most important and meaningful things that you ever do. But knowing and being able to determine the difference will make the difference between whether or not you're harmed by it or positively helped by it. 
the game doesn't begin till you reach five grams. So again, I'm just kind of working out these ideas with you in this video, and I hope that they made sense. And if I dropped any threads along the way, or there are other pieces that you felt I could have expanded upon, or even places where I accidentally contradicted myself, I'd really appreciate it if you could let me know in the comments below this video, either on YouTube or at Adventures Through the Mind, and I will be sure to respond to them. I, I want to learn, and it's in community that I can learn, and I want to know what's meaningful to you and um, what type of content is helping you. So getting that kind of feedback is uh, is really positive to develop a, a development of my work and hopefully in, in future videos that will be um, really positive for you as well. And if it was positive, thumbs up would be great because uh, this is a fairly small podcast uh, YouTube channel still. So your subscribes, uh, your likes, your shares are really, really important. And I thank you very, very much for supporting the show in that way. Of course, another way to support the show, uh, like many other YouTubers here uh, on YouTube, is to support me on Patreon. So you can head to patreon.com forward slash jameswgesso or just check out the links in the description below this video. There's also a link to a merch store through my website where you could buy signed copies of my book. Um, and depending on when you're watching this video, get some limited edition art that may still be available. So that's all. Thank you for watching this video and I will see you again soon.